internet seems to think the BRZ and 86 were marketplace failures. And yet Toyota and Subaru sold more than 120,000 of them in the US alone. That's within spitting distance of the total number of sports cars Porsche sold here in exactly that same period of time. So of course there was gonna be a second generation. But from the minute the BRZ debuted, according to everyone with a social media account, the only lightweight, affordable, rear-wheel drive, two plus two sports car you can buy with a manual transmission needed precisely one thing, a turbo. And for the second generation BRZ, Subaru gave this car precisely zero turbochargers. And that's because Subaru studied history and history tells us if you put a turbo on the BRZ, you will kill it, dead, gone. Subaru calls this 2022 BRZ all new, and that's not entirely true, though it's not entirely false either. It's more than a makeover, but less than an entirely new car. It uses the old BRZ's basic platform with a new bigger engine and all new sheet metal. The BRZ looks like a Honda, an Acura, a Buick, and a Porsche. It's not up to me to decide whether that's a good thing, but it definitely doesn't look like the old BRZ. It's still a joint effort between Toyota and Subaru, and so there will be a Toyota version. Some highlights include an aluminum roof, hood, and fenders for better weight distribution, and an even lower center of gravity. And this car also claims a 50% increase in torsional rigidity, which also helps handling and steering. And of course, it has an all-new interior with a digital gauge cluster. This time, Subaru didn't fit the BRZ with crappy Eco tires, at least not with the optional 18-inch wheels. They come with sticky Michelin Pilot Sport 4 tires, like the old Performance Package car, and that addresses one of the old car's biggest flaws. The biggest flaw of the old car was unquestionably the engine. The FA20 was a grovelly, torqueless letdown which is actually not entirely fair because it made the same amount of torque as every other naturally aspirated two liter four cylinder. But it happened so high in the rev range that you had to beat the snot out of it to get there. And it sounded so bad that you never wanted to. Worse, it had what became infamous as the torque dip. From 2,500 to 4,000 RPM, where most engines start to come alive, the FA20 fell on its face. By the time it woke back up at 4,500, it started to sound like a drain disposal with a fork in it. And you'd already lost the race by that point anyway. Without even having driven the BRZ, I know that Subaru has fixed the torque problem. And I know this because I have a calculator and no social life. Thank you very much, COVID. To illustrate, I'm going to use the Mazda MX-5 Miata, a car that is the closest spiritual match to the BRZ. But also, it has a two liter four cylinder that makes exactly the same amount of torque as the original BRZ. And yet no one in the history of the world has ever said an ND needs a turbo. I fact checked it. No one said it. This is a graph that shows the old BRZ's torque deficit adjusted for weight and gearing relative to the ND2 Miata. As you can see, at every point in the rev range, the Miata has a significant advantage, averaging about 20% in the crucial daily driving 2 to 4,000 RPM range. Meaning, at those engine speeds, the BRZ was some 20% slower than the ND Miata. This new BRZ has a 2.4 liter in place of the old two liter, and that's a 20% displacement bump. Unfortunately, it doesn't come with a 20% power bump. It only makes 11% more power, but it makes 22% more torque. And instead of peaking at 6,400 RPM, it peaks at 3,700, and that is a huge difference. Now let's look at that graph of weight adjusted torque versus the ND2 Miata, you know, the car that nobody says needs a turbo. This is now a completely different story. At every single engine speed above 2000 RPM, the new BRZ has a small but significant advantage, meaning it will pull ever so slightly harder than the Miata. Yes, it still has a torque tip, but instead of losing more than 15 pound feet, it loses five and over a much smaller rev range. And at the bottom of the dip, it makes nearly 30 pounds feet of torque more than the old engine did at its peak torque. Turbochargers add more than just torque. Turbos add complexity, turbos add weight, and turbos add something else that everyone always forgets about, and that's cost. I am sick of every car I test costing $100,000. There used to be an entire class of sports coupes 
that we could all afford. There was a Mazda RX-7, there was a Nissan 240SX, Mitsubishi Starion and Chrysler Conquest, Mitsubishi Eclipse, Eagle Talon, Honda CRX Prelude and Del Sol, Acura Integra, Corolla AE86, Ford Probe and Mazda MX-6, Mazda MX-3, Hyundai Scoop, Hyundai Tiburon, Volkswagen Scirocco, Isuzu Impulse, Nissan Pulsar and the NX, Toyota Celica, MR2, Pontiac Fiero, Subaru XT, Mercury Capri, and they're all dead because you got greedy. Oh, it has to be this fast. Oh, it has to have that luxury feature. Guess what happens? It gets so expensive, you can't afford it. That's what happened to the Mark IV Supra. It was amazing, but it was so expensive, no one bought it because no one could afford it. I don't care that this car can't keep up with a McLaren in a straight line. I don't care at all because it's meant to be an affordable sports car. In 2009, the world economy was in dire financial straits. Toyota had just increased its investment in Subaru, and so the two arch rivals put down their swords and played nice for one common goal. There's a great irony here. The BRZ and 86 are both companies anti-car. Toyota, maker of beige Camrys, wants a sports car? Subaru's entire image is all-wheel drive cars, yet its performance car is a rear drive? These cars are both management-issued hall passes. They're the types of cars that neither Toyota nor Subaru would make because everything in this class has failed by pricing itself out of existence. Even the Miata, that paragon of lightweight simplicity, isn't exactly cheap. Loaded up and financed, it'll cost you nearly 40 grand. And that's why its average buyer is 62 years old. What 25-year-old do you know that can afford a $40,000 toy without a trunk and a back seat to have sex of tires in. No, this car benefits you, the type of person who can afford to have one reasonably priced car that you have to live with every day. Adding a turbo at the manufacturer level adds a cascading avalanche of cost that's gonna be passed on to you. You add a turbo, the next thing you need, you need a bigger diff and a bigger drive shaft, and then the rear subframe has to be reinforced, and then you got bigger brakes in the back, and of course, bigger tires back there. So then you have to completely if redo you just the suspension. Keep adding, which adding, obviously, then so the more cost you add, the fewer people, people, people buy their car, less money will be needed. Fine, I'll stop whining about the money, but I will say that I don't think Subaru went far enough. We know Subaru can build 8,000 RPM engines, they do it now. This BRZ should have revved to 8,000 RPM and thus made 250 horsepower without a turbo. In addition to the cost, putting a turbo on it would actually force Subaru to completely scrap the BRZ and start over. Look, this car was designed from the outset to have an extraordinarily low center of gravity for handling. And so Subaru mounted that pancake-shaped flat four really low. It's like ankle height. The intake's on top, the exhaust is on bottom, where do you put a turbo? On cars like the WRX and STI where the engine's already high up, well, you can route the exhaust underneath and around, but those long runners are a recipe for turbo lag. And let's think about what happens to a well-balanced car when you add turbo torque and turbo lag. Hello, BMW M3. It goes from being a scalpel to an explosive disaster. Add too much to the BRZ's base price and another problem arises. Its interior mm, would not be okay. It's barely acceptable at this price point. I mean, the seats look gorgeous. They look and feel like Recaro's, but there's a lot of cheap plastic in here. And that center screen, it looks, uh, well, at least it has Apple CarPlay. And the gauges, they are gimmick free. They're driver focused. I really like this. Subaru also got rid of the intake resonance tube and is piping fake engine noise to the speakers, which I normally don't like, but that last engine sounded so bad that I'm fine with it here. And I got a ride in one of these cars around a racetrack with a helmet on, and what I did here sounded pretty good. The driving position is still perfection, and the back seats still fold down so you can throw a set of track tires in the back. Or you can engage in other adult activities that you can't do in the back of a Miata, like reading a book. I will point out for the conspiracy theorists that the rear trunk lid is two pieces. This is metal, that is plastic, which means this whole thing can be replaced. Maybe that's so Toyota can do their own rear end treatment, or maybe it's so that Subaru can easily put a big spoiler on it for the STI version, which would have a turbo and would cost 50,000 bucks. Listen, if you wanna walk into a Toyota dealership and buy something that's not really a Toyota, has a turbo on it and costs 50,000 bucks, you can buy a Supra. 
for half that money, the last BRZ was already one of the most thrilling, best handling sports cars at any price. And before anyone's even driven this new BRZ, math tells us that Subaru fixed that car's one and only real flaw. In a world of heavy, complicated, expensive, supposed sports cars, I am so happy that a car like this still exists. And you should be, too. Welcome back. Okay, so you're just gonna keep the Ferrari framed out the entire time, right? Yep. Okay. Action. I'm not some rich YouTuber asking you to like and subscribe. Hey, up, 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 keep the Ferrari out. I'm an automotive journalist asking you to like and subscribe. And that's because that's how YouTube works. If you don't click those buttons, YouTube doesn't know you liked what you've just seen and isn't gonna show you any more of it. And if you don't like what you've just seen, well, join the club. And by that, I mean the Haggerty Drivers Club, which gets you access to this award-winning magazine, as well as discounts on amazing stuff. And if, if you still don't like what you've seen, well, then just leave a nasty comment, because that's how the internet works. I need to go clean that up.